Welcome to the launch of the Klaus Jürgen Bata Leadership Programs Future Leadership Series in partnership with UCT's Center for Extramural Studies and UCT's Futures Think Tank. My name is Belisa Rodriguez, the Program Manager of the KJB Program and your host for today. A little bit about the Klaus Jürgen Bata Leadership Program. It was established at the University of Cape Town in March 2014 through a gift donated by Professor Klaus Jürgen Barter of Massachusetts, USA. And the primary goal of the program is to produce graduates with outstanding leadership qualities uh, and a strong sense of social justice, who will go on to play leading and significant roles in business, government, and industry and civil society in South Africa, but also across the African continent. Um, and today we are launching uh, the first of uh, hopefully a monthly series uh, called the, the KJB Future Leadership Series. And the aim of this series is to really give a platform and to amplify the voices of young future leaders on important issues, uh, both locally and globally. And today's speakers are currently UCT students um, who are also KJB scholarship holders in, conversa in conversation with uh, a guest moderator, futurist Abbas Jamie. And I will be uh, introducing them a little bit later on. So today we'll be looking at an important topic and we've called it, who cares? Uh, what does an institution of care look like for the future of work, play and study? Um, and it's going to be led by young people who have um, really sort of experienced um, institutions such as the University of Cape Town, um, but will also give us an insight into what a culture of care could look like for the future. Um, why this is important uh, locally is that uh, these insights will be fed into the Futures Think Tank really to uh, contribute towards the University of Cape Town's Vision 2030 and its massive transformative purpose. Uh, and one of the important topics is around a culture of care. So um, I would like to introduce uh, our moderator, Abbas Jamie. Uh, he has more than 30 years of experience across government and private sector and has been involved in a broad range of industries from setting up startup businesses to working for NYSE listed company. He has a broad range of qualifications, engineering from UCT, uh, but also business future studies, design thinking and project management. He is passionate about mentoring and is registered as a qualified coach and is currently co-creating the future with the University of Cape Town. Uh, the Western Cape Provincial Government and the APRM at the African Union. So very much in the strategic uh, seat uh, when it comes to creating futures for institutions. And in conversation with uh, three UCT students, I'll introduce Liajo first. Liajo Sabesho is a fifth year medical student who is passionate about youth development and equity in healthcare. She is an Abe Bailey Scholar and a Global Surgery Research Student. She has led in various university structures, including being the Deputy Chairperson of the Health Sciences Students Council and Convener of Student Parliament. So welcome Liajo. And then we have Callum Tilbury. He's a final year engineering student at UCT who firmly believes that engineering is as much of a social science as it is a physical science. He's passionate about embracing a multidisciplinary approach uh, to 21st century problems, understanding both the highly technical and the tricky social aspects of emerging technologies. And last but not least, we have Bezeka Mzama, born in KZN, is currently studying towards a Bachelor of Business Science, specializing in computer science at UCT, with a passion for people, stories and tech. Uh, the project closest to her heart at present is the 2100 Stories project that aims to collect 2100 stories from women across the country to end gender-based violence. And she has a particular interest in edutech. On the screen, you will see uh, uh, later on that we welcome your input uh, if you want to post any questions using the ask a question feature. And we will make time at the end for, for, for those questions to be, to be answered. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand over to Abbas Jamie to take us through the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes um, around this really important topic of who cares? Thank you.
Thank you, Elisa, and thank you for the introduction. And I must say, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, and so, so, you know, for creating the space and I always enjoy the opportunity to engage with, with the youth of our country and the continent. Uh, for me, it not only keeps me young, but it gives me a better idea of what the future can, can look like. And so I think uh, the three um, youth that we have here uh, representing uh, the voice of, of, of the broader youth of Africa is going to be really exciting. So I'm looking forward to the input into the, the Vision 2030 of, of, of UCT. So just some, some quick background for those people who don't know. Um, the Future Steam Tank was established by the VC towards the end of 2018 with the intention of saying, how does UCT respond to all this disruption that was happening at that point? You know, there's a lot of disruption. There's still a lot of disruption we see now. Um, but at that stage, we're saying so, so the higher education space is going through a lot of changes. Um, there's all this technology, the fourth industrial revolution. And, and so what is UCT's response to that? And, and she set up the, the Futures Think Tank, uh, the range of people from across the university and some external people as well. Um, and, and one of the first things that the, the Futures Think Tank did uh, was say, well, it's not so much about what is, how does UCT respond to this disruption, but it actually says, how does UCT position itself as a disruptor and the shaper of the future? And so it is that fundamental um, uh, mind shift change that needs to take place as far as saying, we can't predict the future, but you can be part of creating a better future. And I think UCT is in a very English position in that it is well positioned on the African continent as an institution of higher learning to actually make a significant contribution. And so the three students that we have here today, you know, they are sitting in a position of a real privilege. And, and the challenge that I always put to youth is how do you use that privilege um, and take on that responsibility to shape the future? And, and so we put forward this narrative of, of UCD starting to shape the future. And, and one of the things that came out of that was we came up with what you mentioned, a massive transformative purpose. And what the massive transformative purpose is, is it sits almost above your vision and mission statement. It's this North Star that guides the organization. It's this future that you want to create. Um, and for UCT, we came up with unleash human potential to create a fair and just society. And so that landed um, in 2019 and it went to uh, the Vision 2030 organization with a group, which is the leadership of, of UCT. Uh, they bought into it, went to council, the council bought into it. And, and so that's rolling out now across UCT's starting to get more uh, feedback from people to this vision 2030 years of unleash when we say hashtag unleash and so it's a really exciting time at UCT uh, with UCT saying how do we embrace these skills of the future you know we start talking about future studies we are talking about complexity we start talking about design thinking bringing those skills and enhancing the very good core skills sitting in UCT with these skills of the future and, and part of, of, of what we do as, as the Futures Think Tank in using design thinking uh, tools is, is to try and get feedback from people as quickly as possible. So we have an idea, we take it out, we call diverge thinking, and, and I think this is very much part of that. So the webinar series today, um, not only the, the voices that we're going to hear from the people in the room today, but also the, the people attending and going to be asking questions, you know, the, the outcome of this is going to be fed directly into the Futures Think Tank, which gets fed directly into the Vision 2030 group. And, and, and that's what, you know, the Futures Think Tank is about. It's about giving agency to voices from across the university. So we really um, welcome the opportunity to be part of, of this future series. And again, thank you for, for, for giving us uh, this, this opportunity and to hear the voices of, of, of the youth. So um, we're going to start, that's just some context. Um, I'm going to start by asking Fezi a, a, a question and then we'll ask all three uh, the participants a question, but we'll start with Fezi. Um, so when we say a caring institution, um, you know, what does a caring institution look and feel like for yourself and for students, or broader student body and for staff and other stakeholders? You have, what's your view on that? Um, so when we when we got this topic as a trio, we kind of just sat down and, and spoke a little bit about what the question itself meant for us. What does a caring institution look like? What does UCT actually look like at present? What can it be? Um, and we kind of came to the conclusion that there are three main aspects that we kind of wanted to delve into. Um, the relationships between students, the relationships between the student body and the university, and the relationship between the university and broader society. And I will be handling mainly the student to student um, perspective. As a person who's been in student leadership at the very base level, I was in housecom. Um, one thing that I can say is that 
students do care about each other. I feel like especially in the risk space, you see it over and over again. You see students go to bat for each other. You see students lift each other up. And even in our faculties, you see it happen. Um, so I think even when I put a question, when I put the question out to my own circles, I put the question out, do you care about UCT? Do you feel like UCT cares about you? But And do you care about other students? Resoundingly, the answer was no, I don't care about UCT. No, I don't think UCT cares about me. But yes, I do care about other students. And I think that is a really great place to start from as students in terms of fighting for each other, fighting for the voices of students to be heard and, and fighting for the institutions to become more caring in nature overall. Thanks, Fizik, for, for that opening statement. I'm going to uh, pose the same question to Liapo. Um, Liapo, your input. Thank you for the question. I'd like to tackle this, this question from the perspective of how UCT as an institution relates to students. Um, and I'd really like to use this imagery of a parent um, and how if a parent has a couple of children, there's a different approach that the parent needs to have to dealing with certain issues that that child may have. Um, so it's understanding that care is needed to help them, you know, navigate through challenges, but also understanding that you need to motivate that child to unleash their full potential. Um, so UCT needs to understand what kind of a child it's caring for. First and foremost, as a historically white institution, it doesn't necessarily look like that anymore, meaning that there are unique challenges that it's currently facing that may have not been there when the university was initially established. And the student population that it's now caring for and needing to cater for isn't the student population that it was designed and built for. Um, and for me, that's the starting place of, of having this conversation. So I see care as a responsiveness um, and creating an environment that brings the least amount of harm, right? And for me, the question around does UCT care about me as a student was very, very, you know, something that rang in my head for weeks and months on end around the 2015-2017 protests, um, you know, where we got, we, we saw, you know, this mass engagement um, from students about fee issues. And I mean, it was a broader conversation around wealth distribution. It was a conversation around elitism, classism, you know, who's the university for, etc. right? But I'd, I'd say that to many extents, the outcome of that period silenced and shifted the student voice, right? And because of that silencing and shift in the student voice, I actually believe what we're dealing with now is a new normal. It's a new normal. So a caring institution needs to acknowledge this new normal, acknowledge this history and not avoid it. And before we can even start engaging on, you know, the fourth industrial revolution and technology, et cetera, we need to acknowledge this new normal, understanding who is the child that I'm caring for, what have they struggled with and what are, what are their bleeding issues that they have? Um, and just furthermore, saying that it's the context that students exist in and the social groups and intersections that exist in the in the university, very different to what it's been historically, right? So currently for me, I think, I, I feel that people feel UCT doesn't care about them because it's this constant need to assimilate and rebrand to fit into a UCT brand, right? And I think that a university needs to, the personality of a university needs to be determined by the students, not the students coming in and the personalities dictated by the institution. And that's currently what we have at UCT. Many students will describe this sort of um, uh, culture shock that they get when they came to UCT. Very well described, very well known. So there needs to be a commitment from UCT as a carer to pick up the areas of difficulty for students, right? So the culture shock and the, the having to, to uh, um, adapt, of course, all institutions and students coming from high school, they have to adapt, but the adaptation that is needed to be in UCT with the culture and the community that UCT exists in um, presents a particular challenge. Um, and lastly, on this point, I'd just like to say that um, a, a caring institution is an institution that understands that it needs to protect its students from the issues that also plague the world, right? Meaning that if gender-based violence is increased in society, it's also increased among students. If there's a high, high, if there are high levels of depression in society, it means that there are high levels of depression within the university space, right? So understanding that and saying to uh, as a parent, you know, that UCT is as a carer, um, how am I going to deal with this and protect them to the extent that I can? and what structures and resources can I use to better protect them? Thanks, Leah, for those 
for that input. Um, I'm going to ask Callum to come in. I know Callum is an engineer like myself, but uh, he's, 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 he's not a hardcore technical engineer. He's definitely got the social side uh, part of his part of his uh, discipline. So Callum, over to you. Thanks, Alice, and thanks, uh, Liako and, and Fizeka, for those really thoughtful responses. You know, I think when we were discussing the question and just this kind of whole concept of who cares, um, as Fizeka already mentioned, there are these kind of three themes of, you know, students and students, UCT and students, and then UCT and the world. And they kind of came up and I was really feeling passionate about the whole UCT and the world and that interaction. And what does that look like in terms of this institution of care? And I think what's really fascinating when you when you look a little bit deeper is that these two aforementioned uh, perspectives in terms of this, the relationships between students and the relationship between students and the institution actually filters down from UCT's relationship with the world in the sense that what UCT maybe it sometimes feels like, I think, and, and this is what Liako was chatting about, is that there's a lot of focus on the external, a lot of focus on on output, on rankings, on image, you know, and I think, you know, the, the honest truth is that it's not entirely UCT's fault because while there is some responsibility in terms of every institution has responsibility, we can also look like in the broader university structure about how we incentivize a university space. And I think perhaps the whole university experience has become too commercialized and too prettified in the sense that it has to look good on the on the outside and we you know focusing on rankings we focusing on these things that actually perpetuate these elite you know kind of classes and then what happens is that because that fo focus is so external that filters down to if we constantly focusing on the outside we can't focus on the inside we can't focus on the, the actual reality of students on the ground um and you know and then that i think also filters into then how students view each other across even different faculties and so when i think of an institution of care it's also thinking how do we change this external narrative and these external structural factors such that we can focus on the students and we've actually not just we care about the students but we've actually facilitated a university environment whether that's for teaching or research that facilitates care you know and that it doesn't have to be this commercialized we need to make the external look as good as possible we need to focus on the rankings and i think we that starts with us interrogating those things what do these rankings mean do they just perpetuate privilege and uct as a historically white university in our minds, we perceive it as a great university, the best institution in Africa, and then the rankings reflect that and therefore it reflects in our minds and it's the cycle, you know, and I think that. I think that the first step for this university and institution of care is, is looking at these things and interrogating that and saying, how can we actually create structural structures that facilitate care? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Callum. And and great input first round from from all three the, the panelists today um so absolutely i think the the topics that you're speaking to um you know it, it's what we call complex wicked problems right and, and spaces and and when it comes to complexity the, the first rule of complexity we say is that there is this very simple and clear answer that's completely wrong because when you're dealing with complexity, there is no one answer. It's so complex and when you do something, it reacts in a certain way. And so dealing with this issue and I think the, the rapid change that's happening in the world and you see that happening with, with COVID as well um, and people are reacting to things. M most organizations are just reacting. Um, and, and yes, they need to react to the year and now, but ultimately how many people are actually looking into the future beyond COVID and, and said, how do we shape that future? And so UCT is not on its own with regard to rankings. As you know, it's a global issue and how universities are measured. And so again, what does a future African university look like? Um, and, and where do rankings sit in that? And specifically when you start talking about a caring institution, is that a conflict with the ranking? Um, you know, is it is it the line? Um, and, and so those are the complex 
discussions that need to, to take place. But I think I'd like to move to the next question, which is more, so that's great. I think you, you, you've already um, given good context to, to the discussion. But I think the next question, I'd, I'd like to put the ball almost back into your court as far as saying, so you are the youth. If I give you the opportunity now to say, as this youth council that needs to implement this journey of UCT becoming a caring organization, what are the, the things that you will implement? What are the low hanging fruits that you believe you can implement now that can start UCT on this journey of becoming a caring institution? I'll open it up to, to anyone to, to, to start that. Aliyah, you want to go? Yeah. So sure, I'll, I'll get started on that question. So also just tackling this from the perspective of the relationship between the university and students. And I think for me personally, I think I'm, I'm, bit, I'm I feel comfortable um, engaging with this because of my experience with student governance in the university. Um, so, for example, I'd really like to start with mental health um, and um, if, if we think about like the design thinking process and we think of, you know, the first two steps, which is to first empathize and then to define. Um, for me, I think, you know, UCT had no choice but to empathize with the mental health crisis that they, that is among students, um, particularly in the period of 2017, where we had, you know, these high levels of suicide um, among students, right? Um, and I, I think that there is a degree um, that the university can empathize more with what's actually going on um, among students. But for me, what I'd actually like to speak to is more around this step of actually defining what the problem is. Um, so I think in defining the problem, the discourse has really been around, you know, increasing the capacity, getting social workers in, getting psychologists involved. and. Of course, these things are very, very important and very pivotal to mental health care, right? But I think for me, I'd, write, I'd like to go deeper and say that have we actually even started at the point of speaking about why is UCT a particularly toxic environment for students where these mental health issues actually get exacerbated by the environment? You know, so, so saying, OK, what are these underlying issues and what are the preventative measures that can be put into place to avoid certain things, right? So what are the day to day things that can be improved? It's things like how coursework is structured, who the coursework is designed for, who it caters to. Um, do students have a place to live? Do students have food to eat? Are students coping? Is someone aware of the fact that students are not coping? And, you know, it actually reminds me of a time in 2016 in my first year when I came to UCT, the first thing that happened that I can 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 attach to the university is the over over allocation of residents that happened. In my year, the over allocated residences, people travel from all over the country to come to UCT. And I actually had students who had traveled from Eastern Cape who were squatting under my balcony in residence on the street just because of an administrative issue. And what do I, wh where am I going with this? I'm saying that there's certain pain and struggles and hardships that on an administrative level can globally be avoided because what it results in is students feeling uncared for and amongst other things that they will tackle and, and encounter along their journey, it really does lead to poor well-being and the possibility of poorer mental health outcomes. Um, so for me, it's just the unpacking of those underlying issues and dealing with the, 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 the issue from the ground up. The second thing is, is the idea around who are the vulnerable students in the university. You know, I always think about how a lot of the faculties have a lot of um, extended programs that they offer. I know at Health Sciences in Medicine, we have one. I know that um, in Engineering, they have one. And in, in the other faculties, they also have these programs. And the reality is the people who end up in these extended programs are the Black, poor, vulnerable students, right? And the program is designed in such a way where in some faculties you can choose to go into the extended program, where sometimes it's as a result of failure. And the reality is, who ends up in these extended programs, right? They exist, they're supposed to be there to be like a safety net, but who fails? Who ends up there? So why not be proactive and say, who are the vulnerable students? Let's actually identify who the vulnerable students are as soon as they're walking into the university, in, into the university space. And for me, I think the low hanging fruit is faculties that have got this right. For example, the co commerce faculty has the EDU program. They receive support, they receive resources. And, and for me, it's actually not even about the statistics of do people in the EDU program end up passing more than the people in mainstream. It's not about that. For me, it's about the experience, 
right? Resulting in students not having to go through pain and struggling to get their degree, but actually just feeling supported and cared for and not having to struggle um, as, as they go through their university trajectory. Um, and then the last thing from my side is just that I believe that the university needs to be very radical um, and if it needs to be made around centralizing and honoring student leadership and student activism and student governance. I feel that um, student student structures do a lot of work. Societies, the SRC, faculty councils do a lot of work for the university. When you're in those positions, I promise you it feels like it is a full time job, right? But the lack of support amongst other issues um, that exist in the university has resulted in this shift where what we're seeing now, particularly in 2020, this is very evident, of course, because of the lockdown and people being at home, but it's not an, an issue that is new to 2020, is the student activism and engagement and work that is actually being directed outside of the university. Students are, are starting organizations, nonprofit organizations, et cetera, right? They're active citizens, but that means that there's a disassociation between the work being done by students and how much of it is actually being harvested in the university space. So for me, the low hanging fruit is the organograms exist, the structures exist, solidify them, put more resource and effort and ideas and, and, and thinking and innovation into those already existing structures so to solidify them so that students can feel more supported and cared for when they too are actually doing the work for the university. Thanks, Leopold, for that fantastic. Um, input and some really great ideas there that I can see how we can definitely take that forward. Um, Fezzi, you want to come in on your side? Sure, I think just picking up from where Liajo um, ended off, um, as a person who was in housecom, it is a full-time job. And again, definitely we've seen more and more students been away from working for students on an official basis. In my res, I've seen repeatedly there are students who are pillars of strength, who everyone goes to, but they run away from the bureaucracy and all that is attached to being like in a house comm, et cetera, et cetera. And that does to an extent come down to the fact that you can be working hard for the university and there isn't any support for you, even on a, an academic level. Um, just realizing that maybe someone needs a little bit more time to get something done because they have 500 other tasks to do in order to improve the resident space, in order to improve lives of other students, you know. And I think even like that sort of thing does speak to the to, to, to the desire for service, to the desire to give to students between students. But I will say that as much as students care about each other, they also exist in silos of care. It's like students who live in the race system care about each other and will go to bed for each other because the issues that they're facing are the same. But students who don't have those issues aren't doing that. And I think 2015 and Feasons Fall, et cetera, really highlighted that. There was a group of students who were saying, no man, we're trying to get degrees, we care about leaving, we care about getting things done and getting out of here. And there were other students who were really living in a space and, and saying, no, I can't finish my degree, I can't move on from this space because of my circumstances. And so I think the university needs to kind of ask itself how we can create not even just not even just conversation, but like a cross cultural like system of care and system of sharing of experiences that is that is deeply ingrained in each person who leaves UCC. You don't want to have people leave UCC and just be specialists at doing something. You want to leave with them being specialists at doing something, but also caring about the society in which they're going out and going to work in. Because the truth is, South Africa is broken in in a lot of in a lot of ways. And if you aren't developing that that culture on a student to student basis, what are the chances that an individual is going to go out into the world and want to propel a culture of as people we care about each other within greater society? So that's one thing. And I also think that. Cross-cultural research and cross-faculty um, cross research, cross-disciplinary cross -disciplinary research is also very important because, again, you've got these silos of work that are happening all over the university, but they're not serving necessarily the issues of South Africa or the issues of students because we are existing in these silos of our own problems and our own privileges and our own black and and that that it creates a system that is kind of broken where there's a large majority of people who just don't see a problem whilst the other part of the the, the entire organization is is living in pain and life is genuinely very difficult for them in the space thanks yeah i think it's always a 
a challenge is the time period that you are at the university. So whether it's from three to five years, you know, and how do you make change um, in, in that short period, but also not lose the agency that's been created when that person leaves and, and how do we keep that, you know, that energy of, of someone um, even after they've left. Callum, uh, your thoughts on, on, on the opportunities and things that you would change? Yeah, thanks. I uh, I thought it was interesting. Uh, I think when you first raised the question, you said something along the lines of low hanging fruit. And I think that what Liako and Fazeka already mentioned are really great, you know, pragmatic and practical ways of, of moving forwards. Um, but I think we also need to maybe take a step back and, and this kind of builds on my previous point of looking at like structural changes and saying, well, does the idea of low hanging fruit like is that even possible and and is it even sustainable you know if we fix these little things will it fundamentally fix things in the long run and will it fundamentally um improve this institution of care to become a more you know like a, a more caring more of a caring space and so i think I think we do need to do kind of question, you know, rather than looking at low hanging fruit, do we need to plant a new tree or do we need to like fundamentally restructure things? And maybe I'm just being a little bit like utopian and, you know, I'm not thinking of like practical solutions, but I think we do need to to look at some more radical solutions and, and not just look at low hanging fruit. And uh, personally, I, I think where that start is is fundamentally looking at new incentive structures and making sure that again the university space is not just a continuation of like the capitalist agenda of pumping out more money you know making more like more money getting people to buy more things and like um and and fundamentally re-looking at that and you know universities in the past historically have been somewhat countercultural. That's where, if you think about it, like new ideas have come, even just in in science, where if society is saying this one thing, it's it's within the universities where people have said, but what about this? Like, what about this direction? And think of where we would be without that. And so I think we need to make sure that we're not just replicating what exists currently in society in terms of inventive incentive structures, and we're replicating that on a, a microcosmic kind of level. Uh, at the university with the same kind of structures and fundamentally think of new things. And I think that that does require cross-disciplinary uh, kind of collaboration, as Bezeka was mentioning. Um, but yeah, new incentive structures and also re-looking at that question of low-hanging fruit and saying, perhaps we actually need to, you know, plant a new tree or, or be a bit more radical about these these solutions, uh, because it's not a it's not a as you said, it's not a simple problem. And so we can't, I don't think we can expect to fundamentally solve anything if we're gonna just do kind of little patchwork, you know. Thanks, Callum. Um, and you'll, you'll be glad to know that you are aligned with the VC's thinking because you know, the, the Vision 2030 group um, has been working on a few projects and, 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 and when we come with these sort of periphery projects, we get told, how, how is this fundamentally going to change the institution? You know, I, I want things that's going to fundamentally bring about change to align us with this, this vision in 2030. So I think the, what I can comfort uh, you with is that in the leadership, that is a lot of the talk. That is the narrative. You know, don't give me side projects. Tell me what, what we're going to change in the core to bring about change. So I, I see that, that strong commitment. And, and so it is about I see my job is creating that fertile ground within the, the, the walls of power so that when new ideas come, it lands in, in, in that fertile space where it is taken up and, and action. So I see we are already five past four and there's some questions starting to come in. So I'm going to go to one question. I know um, we had some more discussion, but let's go to the, the people who have posted questions and, and we can take one day and then let's see how it goes from there. So the first one that came in was, um, Okay, how many students does UCT cater for at the moment? The culture shop is not new. It is an academic institution that has to be run on business principles. I don't believe it can be in local parents. Okay, anybody want to respond to that question? 
for me, you know, first of all, just, you know, amongst the discussions that I've had, even with, with the other panelists, um, for me, my issue is that um, UCT is actually not a business. That is actually my first and foremost point, is that the University of Cape Town is actually a public institution. Um, it's, it's, it's a public institution first and foremost. And the, the idea around public universities is that they're supposed to cater to the country and the people of the country um, where they exist. That's the first and foremost. Meaning that if we look at the demographics and we look at the context of South Africans, the university has to cater to that, right? Obviously, primarily there to provide an education. Yes, that's true. But also as a, as a, as a an, an environment that that exists to also, you know, generate and produce solutions to to issues in society. Um, not just okay, you get education in this field, you get in, you come out. But people are actually going to live and actively contribute to society, right? So, for me, the culture shock is may not be new, right? But it's something that speaks to student well-being, it speaks to student experiences, and for me that has a direct input of who graduates from UCT and who doesn't. And if we're really speaking about creating a fair and just society, we need all members of our society to be able to contribute to society meaningfully, meaning they need to get an education, they need to get jobs. So if people cannot adapt from a culture shock and people cannot you know, be supported through, you know, having to rebrand from rural Limpopo and coming into Rondebosch as a city and being supported through that. For me, I don't think that along the line, that process will, will produce people that are actually going to be able to make South Africa fair um, and just and a society that contributes very competitively globally. Um, and lastly, I, I, I do think that it is those small issues such as the culture of UCT that actually speak to the core that Abbas and, and, and Callum are actually referring to. It is an organizational culture um, and how students experience that organizational culture, especially because the university is for students, does speak to that core and what its, what its mandate is and its existence and what, what that's centered around. So for me, I do think it's not a business, it's a public institution and it needs to cater to the context um, and the demographics of the people for which initially UCT was not created for, but currently it actually serves as um, a university for. Thanks, Leaha. I see. Uh, Liz, you want to also say something? Yes, um, I just wanted to point out that I think um, a lot of the older generation sometimes looks at us and thinks that we are a complacent bunch that is just a weak and always looking for an out. And I don't think that's the case. And I think every single generation of of young people is looked at like that by their forerunners because young people are in a position where they're looking at everything everyone who came before did wrong and it's not okay for us to say oh uct there's always been a culture shock that's not okay just because it's always been there doesn't mean it's healthy doesn't mean it must continue to be perpetuated in the space moreover we're living in and children and young people now are more anxious than ever Care is actually more important now than ever because of the world we live in and because of the social circumstances in which we exist. You know, so it's really not enough to say, yeah, it's always been like this. Yeah, it's a business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen that fail repeatedly all over the world. I mean, capitalism as it's being done right now is the cause of environmental issues, economic issues, social issues. It's not OK for us to be satisfied with the way things have been just because that's how they've been. That's my point. Thanks, Fizz. <clears throat> so we've got quite a lot of questions coming through. I'm going to see how far we can get. So let me move straight on to the next question. Um, came from Simba. I like how the panelists distinguished between the different relationships of care in university. My question is, do you think there's an incentive for students to care about the institution? It seems to be apathy on the part of the student body when it comes to the being involved and truly caring for the institution. Alan, do you want to respond to this? Or? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, thanks, Simba. And yeah, you know, it's maybe it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem in terms of, oh, the students don't care about the institution. Oh, the institution doesn't care about the students. And I don't want to put the burden like completely on the institution saying, oh, we'll only care when the, the university cares. But I think, you know, it's interesting because I think that 
maybe maybe now students are getting to a point where they're feeling apathetic but if we look at the the past few years is that not the students caring is it not is that not a demonstration of them saying we want this and we want to foster a space where you know it is a positive warm welcoming space that does good and produces graduates who can go and change the world we, we want that and repeatedly i think people have been disappointed and therefore now they're perhaps feeling apathetic um so in terms of i, I think that maybe it's just a child like innocence whatever but i think that coming to university you do feel hopeful and you feel excited and it's the buildings are pretty and the people are, are cool and it's exciting and I, I do believe that if the structures are there from from the beginning they won't devolve into that relationship won't devolve into something which becomes um n quite negative and and yeah so i do think that if the university takes that first step it will it will take a it will make a huge difference and that the current apathy we're seeing is perhaps a result of of several years of just fatigue on on behalf of the students thanks Callum. and yahoo please response from your side yeah um i can respond first um yeah, in terms of, you know, the question around whether there's incentive for students to be involved. Um, I mean, it's it's for me, I actually start at the point of is there really incentive for anybody to actually be an activist and actually be engaged in societal issues in general? Right. For me, um, the disengagement or apathy among students, um, I think it speaks to other issues that aren't necessarily inherent to how we are as people. Um, so what what I mean by that is that people actually want to be actively engaged, active citizens. They just don't want to do it in the university space, meaning that people don't have a reason to do it for UCT, particularly not necessarily that they don't care about the issues in society. Right. So that's my first starting point. The second thing from that place is that what happens is that because students feel like I don't want to do the work, there is no incentive. There is no incentive for me to do it in the university space it ends up being work that gets done elsewhere, right? But I really do believe that if the university supported student leadership and honored it and centralized it more, we would see more people being engaged and actually linking this activism that does exist um, outside of the university and linking it to what work needs to be done within the university. So yeah, I think the apathy is, is a general, you know, issue amongst us like um, there are some things that as students we really just don't want to engage in but i don't think overall there's a lack of of engagement and activism among, among students i just believe students have got to the point where the work is being done less in the university space and for me i think there needs to be really radical look into that because a disengaged student populace is is not one that i would want to work with if i was management because you need the student voice you need student input you need student projects you need student engagement um as forming the health of the university. Yeah. Thanks, Leopold. Liz, you want to respond or can I move? Yeah. No, sure. I've got, I've, I guess I've got a little bit of insight and um, it's more of like just a, an addition on what Liaho was saying. I think um, definitely the reason why students have been disengaging is A, past few years have been exhausting and B, it's just the systems that students are being forced to work with when they are working in the, in the student and the UCT space are so draining to use. It's like, where's the efficiency of those 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 systems to allow them to be able to do the work that they need and want to do for the student populace, but still be able to manage their schoolwork and their social lives? How do we create systems in the university space that actually allow for the work to be done better and with less strain put on student leaders and student activists? And also, how can the university stray away from looking at student activists in particular as the enemy and more of a, 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 an ally, an ally in stimulating conversation and triggering the university to realize where they're at fault and where they're falling short, etc. Um, so definitely, I think there needs to be a repairing of the relationship between students and the university in terms of the two need to start seeing each other as allies instead of enemies. But also the university then kind of needs to start building systems that make working in the, the university space easier and more efficient. 
Thanks. Thanks for that input. And I, I think just from my side, you know, so, so when we deal with these complex issues, what we normally do is we, we sort of take a step back and see well, what is happening from a trends perspective, from a global perspective. And, and one thing I can say is that, um, you know, the issues we're talking about is, is not unique to UCT at, at the global level, the, 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 the level of trust between government and citizens is at an all time low. Um, and if you look at the rankings, we, we, we're not even close to the bottom, right? It, and, and so it's even with all the issues we have in our country and, and UCT is definitely a microcosm of broader South Africa, um, you know, we see this polarization across the world. And, and you know, again, the question can, you know, what is causing in the polarization? Uh, if you look on social media, um, you know, that this whole two polar worlds on, on, on social media and, and, and social media enforces those worldviews. And, and so this whole thing of, of collaboration, the whole thing of uh, speaking to each other, um, social media is the worst place for that to happen because it, you, you basically get pushed into your corner and your worldview gets enforced by what you see, what you read on social media. And when you're looking at the other, it's, you know, you can't understand why they're responding that way. In the meantime, the other is seeing a very different views to what you've seen on your social media. And that's the way social media really works. And so, because we need to understand those things when you start dealing with how do we approach these issues in the microcosm like a UCT. Um, and so, so that then speaks to this whole issue of the fourth industrial revolution, how this thing then impacts you know, everything, no matter where you are. So I just want to put that in, and also just to get you people to start thinking about how to tackle these, these, these things through, through different lenses. I'm going to go to the next question um, from Anonymous. Having studied at UCT and UNISA, the first thing I would appreciate is that the administration is student friendly and well stocked. Forms where the online or print copy are easy to return and discuss, that there is an arena for conflict resolution in departments, i.e. students and staff. I'm distressed to hear students who are overbooked in residences. That is not acceptable. The reality is that students have more issues to deal with in this millennial than before. It is encouraging that EMS is exploring this. Please keep up the sort of support. The information so far is experiential. Are the facts statistics available? But more of a comment than a uh, question, unless anybody wants to add to that. Let's move on to the next one. Um, so what role, the next question is from uh, Mutsa, what role does KGB play in the future of UCT? What can be started now and continued by others who are in this program? How important is leadership? So I think that this speaks directly to something that was raised earlier on, you know, you people are a lot of energy while you are at UCT, and this energy goes into setting up programs, etc. How do we carry that through once people move on in the next uh, cohort of students coming? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I so, can speak to that point. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's about three questions in the question, but just basically speaking about student leadership, like other leadership in other spheres, needs to be nurtured, it needs to be grown, it needs to be challenged, right? So what the role is of this KJB program, which I'm so honored to be a part of, is taking someone who's got leadership potential or is a leader in their own right, in their own spaces and saying, well, let me nurture, grow and challenge that leadership to be better, right? And it's actually quite unfortunate that there aren't many programs like this that exist. And there's actually opportunity um, for programs like this to exist. You know, we've obviously got, you know, organizations like Alan Gray, um, where, you know, students get very, very great support, be it financially, be it um, through um, via academics, but also um, one of the mandates there is to sort of create this entrepreneurial culture and, you know, people can become social entrepreneurs, pitch ideas, etc. And what I'm getting to is the fact that AJB as a leadership program um, and with the few others that, that exist, their role is actually to take a cohort of leaders and say, we're going to nurture and grow you. Um, so it's very, very important. And I think the university can use this as a model to model um how leadership can be nurtured throughout the university, identify strong leaders in the various structures that exist, nurture them, um, make it challenging, put them through leadership boot camps and build that. Because for example, I'm sure Fez can attest to this, is when you're actually serving in university leadership structures, 
you kind of have to come in with what you know and make it work. There's no growth and nurturing and assistance. I mean, there are trainings, et cetera, that happen, but to be honest, they're inadequate to actually equip you with what you'll actually have to deal with in those positions and likely in the world. So I think the program that we are part of is, is a starting point to say, look, this is how we're going to challenge you and grow you. These are the kinds of things you need to start thinking about now in your early 20s um, so that when you actually go and become a whoever in society, you're well equipped. Um, and, and and just the last part that, that was asked is how important is leadership? Leadership is extremely important. Um, the society that we live in, and, and I mean, if we look at history, there's always been structures that exist where people have always led and people have always had this sort of authority or, you know, position to direct and lead people in a certain direction. So leadership is important. But for me, it's it's that leadership is important, not just in these big spaces that we think of. Leadership is important in homes, in communities, in small spaces. So we need to build leaders. People need to leave university feeling like they're leaders, not just the loud, um, assertive and charismatic personalities, but everyone needs to actually have a sense of leadership instilled in them so that they can lead in their microcosms that they exist in. Thank you. Thanks, Liako. Where's Callum? Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to build on Liako's point, uh, last point, um, was just about actually coming from a, a boot camp that we did with, with the KJB program a few few weeks ago, which was really incredible. Um, but there's this idea that kind of this recurrent theme of, of micro leadership. And I think that's that's also a really important thing is is being able to lead in small contexts and in small ways whether that looks like mentorship just you know like small scale mentorship within a faculty or whatever it looks like and essentially saying to people in order to get involved in the university you don't have to become SRC president you know and those structures are really important and all of which you know that which we've chatted about already is that's really important but we also need to say to students, hey, like make leadership your own in your own small way, in your own faculty, in your own class. And there are things like class reps and, and others, but fostering that, fostering micro leadership so that each person can make leadership their own, especially because university is such an intense space. It's a lot to ask from people to get involved in those commitments like SRC. And so to say to people, get involved in this small way and still contribute. And if everyone does that, I mean, imagine the, the changes that can be made. And so from a organizational perspective, I think Klaus Jürgen, as scholars, trying to foster those spaces, trying to innovate, how can we foster spaces of micro leadership as well? Uh, that, that's that's super important. Thanks, Anna. Daisy? <clears throat> Um, I definitely, I definitely agree with what Callum said. I think again, res space, the mentors, the cluster reps, they hold the 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 the, the res up. It's like when there are problems, that's who students are going to first as their first port of call. And so yeah, there's definitely a need for for micro leadership, but there's also a need for leadership for the common good. It's all well and good for all of us to be leaders, but if we're leaders with suspect um, agendas, then you ask yourself. I mean, that's that's those are kind of the pitfalls we're looking at as a country. We're looking at leadership that is very selfish, that's very corrupt in nature. I think that's kind of created a, a space where a lot of us are just mistrustful of the people who lead us, and that's not healthy. Um, and so, yeah, definitely good leadership, leadership for the common good is extremely important, and instilling those values in our in our context at UCT is extremely important. I think, additionally. In terms of KJB, as a, as a KJB scholar, I've really enjoyed being in the space because you are kind of motivated by seeing other young people around you really push themselves and really work for the common good and really work for the world around them. And I think there's something to be said about celebrating those faces and celebrating those people who are working in small scale projects that are making different that are making a difference. Um, it's all well and good to celebrate someone who has a business that's hiring five, five, 10, 15 people making a turnover of like 10 million rand. But in this country, cool, thank you entrepreneurship. We're glad that you're making, you're, you're bringing in employment. But in this country, we really need people who are committed to social change and who are committed to leadership for that social change. And I think KJB really emphasizes that. And I think if KJB can kind of raise its voice in the university space and kind of really promote that, 
um, that that culture and that energy, I think that will, will go away to making the institution a better space overall. Thanks, and, and thanks to all of you for, for those responses. I think we got five minutes left. And just to wrap up, I'm going to ask you to give me one, maximum two words in response to UCT's massive transformative purpose. Unleash human potential to create a fair and just society. Your response when you hear that statement as your institution that you're studying at, what word comes to mind? Who's first? <laughs> Faze, you want to go? Sure. I don't have, I feel like I don't have two words. Um, I'll give you a sentence. I'll say <laughs> um, we matter and we are capable. I like that. Cool. Liako? Mine is a couple of words as well. Mine is make the space inclusive. Nice. Helen. I'll try to stick to two words. Uh, unapologetically radical. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, and, and, and it's really been the hours flown by. And, and for me, you know, this is why I love mentoring because when I engage with the youth of Africa and the youth of our country, I just get so motivated about the future. I'm so excited about the future. I can just see you know, a much better future laying ahead because you people are the future leaders of, of, of this continent, of this country. And, and people like myself, our, our job is basically to create that space, to give you that space, to give you the agency um, and, and allow you to, to take up that leadership role. So I'm really excited with what you, uh, you guys are doing, with what the KGB program is doing um, and look forward to you people taking up that role of, of future leaders. So I'm wishing you all the best. Um, for the rest of your studies and looking forward to engaging with you beyond beyond this program and also potentially getting you to to give further input into the future think tank discussion around what a caring institution can be thank you very much Melissa. i'm going to hand back to you um thank you so much uh for that very riveting um discussion and and the insights um i'm i'm very glad that um I wasn't part of your um, pre-discussion, so this was all very insightful and meaningful for for myself as a as an as a as a attendee and as a host. And um, I would like to invite our listeners and our audience, because we'll also have a recording afterwards, and those that have uh, the time to to watch the recording, I'd like to encourage um, everybody to visit our uh, website kjbartaleadership.uct.ac.za and I've posted it in the Q&A as well, as well as follow us on our Facebook uh, page. Uh, I've also posted that link in the Q&A uh, announcement. Um, and I'd like to also invite everybody to, to further discussions where we will broaden the student voice um, into issues that are not just locally homegrown issues, but also issues that are Pan-African in nature, regional issues, as well as uh, global and international issues. So for the next one next month, which, which will also be held on, on a Wednesday on the 28th of uh, October, um, we will, September, October, yes, we will be looking at a Pan-African uh, uh, related topic, which will be announced through our social media and through the EMS uh, um, channels. And that's just from me to, to, to invite you to stay engaged. Um, and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you to the Center for Extramural Studies uh, for your partnership for the Futures Think Tank at UCT. Thank you to Abbas for moderating so beautifully. And thank you to um, our wonderful KJB scholars for their insights and their and their thinking around this particular topic. Uh, we really value value your 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 work and your and your leadership. Thank you and um, all the best for the rest of the day. <laughs>